we would like to welcome you to our webinar. This is the second part of our webinar series on spying on America by foreign made drones. The first part aired June 25th and can be seen at our YouTube channel. It is a part one and part two. The pre-recorded interview with the presenters for this webinar ran over a lot of time as it did with the first one. So we will email you a link to the access the extra discussion content at the conclusion of this webinar. You will also be able to rewatch this webinar afterward through the access link you have been provided for a week before we post the webinar onto our YouTube channel for everyone else to watch. Please post any questions you'd like the presenters to answer after the pre-recorded session finishes into the Q&A panel on the right side of the screen. We also want to thank our sponsors. Without them, we'd be unable to have our conference and webinar series. We especially want to thank our premier sponsor, Honeycomb Secure Systems. They are an elite digital security firm that provides assured, secure information and communication technology solutions within the life cycle of products and systems, ranging from research and development, system design, fabrication, integration, assurance validation and verification, to delivery, operations, and ultimately disposal. If your business would like to sponsor future webinars or topics of interest to you, please contact us. Hello, my name is Bart Massey. I'm the Executive Director of the USA Drone Port. Uh, we have a very interesting topic and some amazing people online with us today from different parts of the nation. Um, I want to thank each of you all for being on here. And, uh, and also, if you don't mind, I'd like to start with Dr. Nichols and let him introduce himself. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Randy Nichols. I'm a professor of practice at Kansas State University and director of the Unmanned Aircraft System Certificate programs along with the upcoming PMT, I'm sorry, Masters uh, in SAME. Uh, I have about 50 years of experience in uh, uh, cyber counterintelligence, forensics, computer security, uh, counter espionage, um, a lot of things that have three letters after them and then also private business of an chief executive officer of a couple of firms that work in the uh, protecting national critical infrastructure. Um, I have two of my authors here, well, at least one of my authors on something that I'd like to, to pass on if I can. We produce the textbooks for Kansas State University's programs and these are available free online. All you need to do is go to www.newprairiepress uh, dot org slash ebooks and 27 slash 27 will give you the unmanned aircraft in in cyber domain second edition and the sister publication which we just finished in 2020 which is counter unmanned uh, systems this is the sister of the, the other one again that one is uh, the same email address I'm sorry same uh, URL which is www.newprairiepress.org slash 31 so there I managed to get it in all the one place <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Nichols. Chris, would you introduce yourself, please? Sure. Hi, uh, Chris Stiles. The, I'm currently the operations director at the USA Drone Port. I've been in unmanned systems since 2004 as Army Military Intelligence. Flew big drones. I've uh, done several years of contracting, both for defense work and for uh, commercial entities. So a little bit of security uh, and information systems on that side. But uh, overall, mostly an operator. So I've got a lot of concerns and worked with a lot of a lot of interested parties in this type of topic over the years. All right, thank you, Chris. Mr. Wingo. Hi, I'm Harry Wingo. I uh, am a professor with the National Defense University. In my background, I started out Navy as a Navy SEAL officer for about six and a half years. Then I went into the law and policy space. Uh, got off active duty, went to Yale Law School, and since then. Uh, I've been blessed to be a, a couple decades into law and tech policy, uh, including being at Google when the attacks out of China happened. That's when I really got the uh, bug for cybersecurity. And I've been a DOD civilian for almost four years now. And the College of Information and Cyberspace at the National Defense University uh, educates strategic leaders, uh, clearly in the United States, but also with our partners and allies about the strategic risk in the cyberspace and information domain. And as far as drones go, uh, I was humbled to have the opportunity to testify on drone supply chain security last June in front of the uh, Senate. Uh, the Senate Commerce Committee uh, Subcommittee on Security uh, talked about this uh, challenge we have with China having this overwhelming market share of small drones less than 55 pounds. So I'm really excited to be here today and uh, look forward to the discussion. Thanks, sir. 
Good day here. Thank you. Mr. Mum. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Hans Mum. Did uh, 17 years with uh, Army Intelligence Officer. Um, most famous actually for uh, this product for the Iraqi regime playing cards with Saddam as the Ace of Spades. I was the officer in charge of that. Created the entire program and then I got lots of free vacations to go over to Iraq and uh, have some fun. Uh, do a few things. Uh, finished up my active duty time as a wounded warrior. Got picked up by the Director of National Intelligence. I was the Division Chief for Cyber for the Office of Director of National Intelligence. Uh, ICD-502 uh, was implemented out of my desk, a lot of other uh, Cyberstorm, a few other things. Went over to Langley, uh, worked on uh, everything from their rogue wireless uh, systems to a few other things, then on to NGA, and then I retired for the second time. Uh, I'm a co-author, actually, with Professor Nichols uh, as well uh, on uh, some, some books trying to assist uh, academia as well as the government in understanding this space uh, and how do we move forward in a secure and logical manner. Uh, and now I actually do a lot more consulting, whether it's with the government or whether it's uh, private industry. There's industries such as the insurance industry that is desperately trying to figure out what does this entire autonomous systems look like? Uh, how do we uh, how do we move within this market and how do we change for it? So uh, really appreciate being here. It's good to have you here. Thank you. And Mr. Joel Felter. But I, I'm a serial entrepreneur for uh, drones, drone three companies, started with military uh, Navy magic program to better manage the data that came off all disparate type of drones and get the data to the warfighter or first responder in real time. Uh, did that for several years, uh, transitioned into the civilian and commercial space, tried to work with the FAA and others to transition some of the great innovations that I saw grow up in this country in support of the military to support public safety and other aspects of civilian and commercial drones. Uh, last three, four years, I've been working on trying to figure out ways to so that drones can go into remote areas through data pods and other kinds of relays so that there can be a way for land, air, and sea drones to work together, mostly in a humanitarian or logistics way. It's good to have you all here. Um, with that, Chris, I think you have the first question today. I do. And this question is for Dr. Mum and Dr. Nichols, Professor Nichols. Uh, what methods and vulnerabilities can foreign actors utilize against current hobby grade drones on the market? You want me to start off, Fonts? Oh, go ahead. The answer is SCADA, SCADA systems. In fact, we cover that rather nicely in one of our chapters. Let me just give you an idea of some of the vulnerabilities and attacks, and I'll run through them very, very quickly because of time. Um, these are the vulnerabilities by a SCADA for UAS. Uh, remote access allows maintenance and IT support. That's what we use for Stuxnet, by the way. Ease of operation outweighs the security. First target of compromise for the attacker. No use of the IT special defenses, wireless technology, system connects to unsecure remotes. SCADA software, this is since 1967, by the way, uh, not designed with robust security features. It never has. It's always been give it to me quicker. Public information always available on the specific systems. It's much worse now because maintenance is done by remote operations. Uh, lastly, uh, let me try some of the attack vectors. Attacks on field devices, database, communications hijacking, man in the middle, bogus input data to the controller introduced by compro compromised sensors, uh, controlled historian changes, dis DDoS, uh, manipulated misleading output data to the actuators. And here's some of your attack hardware and software, just as a quickie. Skyjack, Aircrack, Node uh, Drone, Raspberry, Parrot AR, Alpha, Edimux, Snoopy, and the, line, the list goes on. So my answer to the question is SCADA vulnerabilities allows foreign, foreign and anybody else, by the way, actors to get their hands on uh, unmanned aircraft systems through either remote, direct, ground, satellite, air, or sea, frankly, I think I got, or underwater, since we're looking at that too. All of those get through the main controlling systems that are sensitive, and most of them are not uh, encrypted. So it's in the clear. Hans? So I, I would go with those, and uh, I've worked with most uh, folks who are on this call. So 
Um, I would also look at, you know, if you're looking at the difference of hobby grade versus, uh, you know, a, a military grade uh, type of an aircraft, when you start looking at everything from the uh, unencrypted data links, uh, the uh, ease of man in the middle, which is actually pretty simple these days, um, and then we can start to look at uh, things like supply chain. Um, an attack on the supply chain. So if we look at um, uh, right now, you've got fire departments and law enforcement uh, that are using these things uh, in active uh, investigations and active scenes. Well, now we've got COVID. Uh, now we can't get parts for them. Uh, or what happens if those parts come in and uh, they have extra stuff on it uh, because your part was actually designed to break within X amount of hours of you uh, flying that drone. And under warranty, I'm going to send you a free chip uh, to change out. Uh, you are going to uh, figure that that thing is perfectly fine. Everything is great. Uh, you are not going to do the testing on it. Uh, you are not even going to understand uh, what is on there. Um, that is um, that is something that we have to really uh, consider uh, for you know methods of how to get the vulnerabilities into the systems uh, in order to be able to inject, and then you can just literally look at everything from you know open source information on the web uh, to other things that are out there. Uh, the foreign actors don't have to be very sophisticated these days uh, to get our information and to get a hold of these things. One of the things we have to consider too is. Uh, you know, we used to have a vulnerability uh, in, in the way of a, a barrier to entry. It used to be really expensive to take on the U.S. toe-to-toe -to -toe or take on one of our, our you know, near peers toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Um, that's no longer um, true. Cheap components um, in, in everything that's out there uh, and outdated uh, policies, whether they're ITAR or, you know, laws that are out there, they're simply outdated and they haven't kept up with uh, the situations or they're very difficult to enforce, uh, has left the vulnerability uh, unbelievable when it comes to a hobby style drone or even a military drone. And if I'm looking at the idea that I don't have billions of dollars uh, to go and, and create a drone program, but what I do have is a couple of thousand dollars to figure out how to steal yours. Very good. Okay, um, the flight data that uh, goes through our smartphones through the internet, um, does it go back to the developer? And also, if it does go back to the developer, what can we do uh, to prevent that from going to possibly a foreign country? Dr. Nichols? I want to uh, continue with Hans's, and probably Harry will give you a much better answer on the supply chain than I will. But Frankly, yes, it goes back. There's practically no way to stop it unless we have control of the supply chain and the chips themselves. Look, with IoT and AI, as Hans is quite familiar with, I can tell you how many times you flushed your toilet by just looking at the heating valve system and the electrical impulses in your house. That's all I need to do, especially with these smart meters. Well, with, with an unmanned aircraft system, let me give you an idea what I can do. I wrote down some notes here. I can change the no flight zone restriction. This is on, on the UAS itself. I can change the altitude limit. I don't have to be hooked into 400. I can increase the flying range to upwards of three miles or boost it directly. I can upgrade or downgrade the firmware directly and I can speed boost, the racers do this all the time. There was an interesting study out at uh, McCarran, uh, Las Vegas uh, airport. And let me see if I can give you the exact numbers here. Yes. 1,356 drone flights within five miles of the airport. 785 of those were within one mile of the, of the airport, which is a FAA violation. 296 of those were above 400 feet, of which 50 were above 1,000 feet. So both of those are violations. And here's the interesting statistic. None were reported to the FAA, zero. My point is that if we do not control the the innards, the hardware and the software, but more of the hardware, uh, the chips coming in, especially on things like DJI, almost all of them have a back door that can take us out. And you may say, well, what is, you know, so what? What does that really mean? So, so information is going back to the OEM. Um, I had a, I have a list of, of what happened in terms of our military. These are on the, my side, which is the counter espionage, cyber espionage. These are the following systems that have lost data to China. 
the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, the F-18 Fighter Jet, Patriot Missile System, RQ-4 Global Hawk Drones, P-8 Poseidon, the UH-60, the Littoral Combat uh, Ship, Army's Terminal High Altitude Defense Missile System, the Aegis System, the White House Computer Systems Compromised, Nuclear Codes, which was done in 2019 and 20, uh, temporarily taking control, by the way, of the NOAAA, that's the National Oceanic and uh, Atmospheric Administration's weather satellites. And lastly, the Civil Reserve Air Fleet. This is serious stuff. If uh, the foreign actors can get their hands on some of our most advanced weapon systems, what do you think they can do with the, the simple uh, privacy issues and uh, us as human beings sitting out there saying, gee, the guy's using a, a drone to spy on my daughter. I mean, what do I do? The, the range is huge, and it all comes down to who owns the hardware, software, and the security of those hardware and software items. But I'm, I'm going to pass it to Harry if I can, because I know he's really, really good at this. Oh, thanks, Randy. I, I agree with what Randy said, and I would, I would add another point. Uh, your question asked about uh, flight data stored on an inter uh, internet-connected device, and your answer really is in the question. <laughs> so right when you have internet connection, uh, it, that's, that's really tough. You're opening up risks right there. Uh, that said, if you add on top of it something Randy mentioned, if the foundation is in the wrong place, and I would say the foundation, nothing against the Chinese people, but if you look at a company like DJI, which has a lion's share, over 80% of the market in the United States, definitely over 75% globally, there is definitely a backdoor issue. You have to ask about the provenance of the components, but even if you were to get a pristine device, which is questionable. Even if you got a pristine device, the back and forth that's gonna go on, and, and Hans made a great reference to that, is gonna open you up over the life cycle of your device, which is something to consider. I would really recommend that folks go back to some of the basic resources that we have. The Department of Commerce has a fantastic team at NIST. They put out all the basic documents, but just do a quick search for IoT, for Internet of Things, and of course, what's going on with drones and being connected, there are a lot of those issues. Uh, one important thing to consider though, is if you want to reduce your risk, you, you can manage risk, you can't eliminate it. It depends on who's using these devices. If you consider drones and where you might reduce your risk through things like, what is my internet connection doing? Of course, your teams, uh, if you're doing this for industry, say you're in the critical infrastructure space, which is of immense concern, why? If this data flow is going back and somebody might say, well, who cares if my drone uh, sees a pipeline here or a substation there? It's about the scale and scope. When you have the Chinese government to have carte blanche within that nation to get access, they can add together the mosaic. All the tiles come up to a very big picture. And then if you consider the chronicle over time, that, that information is dangerous even for consumer use, I would say but especially when you look at critical infrastructure use and law enforcement is right there as well. So I would say the, the basic things that go with a good cyber hygiene, professionalism that you have in the cyber risk management, uh, that's, that's part of it. But I think leaders, when you go up to the C-suite and you say, how do I reduce my risk? And also how, do we, how can we just really contribute to the uh, security of the nation? I think that our C-suite and strategic leaders definitely on industry, but also in the government should be asking. I think there's a reason why Army in 2017 said, look, the risk is too high. Recently, we had the Department of Interior earlier. Thank you for the secretary. Even though you had a lot of well-meaning folks who said, well, we can manage the risk. We can change this. The foundation is wrong. You're going to always have to reset and you have to flip that and say, let's go with some U.S. made as, as much as possible. And I would even make a case for zero Chinese atoms, I have to say, and we may be in a different place for that. I'm convinced that we can do it for less than two times the cost, and we have to start somewhere. Finally, one last thought. This theme goes to not just the data flow risks, which are definitely there for internet connected devices, that's data flow, but there's three dimensions of this risk. The other, these are dual use devices. Your cloud connection, dual use wise, is informing the Chinese military. The other thing that's happening is the third D of that is that we are too dependent. So we're not getting our own AWS, Google, Microsoft, and consider uh, privacy aspects, our uh, approaches 
and standards should be leading. And we cannot let the Chinese government contend, continue. Yeah, DJI, but the Chinese have an advantage here. It's the same as with Huawei. So I would say um, this is a real risk. Thanks. Yeah. I'd like to add on, I won't do that much today, but to things you've, you've kind of touched on independently, you know, a scenario, and I don't want to be chicken little, the sky's falling, but for people to start to think of and conceptualize as a possibility of, you know, take DJI for instance, you know, they like to tout that they've got over a million drones flying around in the, in the US. You know, if you think about that, most, most of those are hobby people flying them. You know, they're not, nobody thinks anything malicious about it, but, you know, even if it's just a good portion of them, you know, they have their account with DJI, they upload their files or their files are synced with, it's just their log file, you know, where they flew. It's not, you know, people don't think of, oh, I don't have any important information. You know, I'm not sending gigabytes worth of video or pictures back to them. It's not, the pictures and the video isn't just the only reason to be worried about this. You know, take for instance, if they're just looking at your, your flight logs, well, that's telling the Chinese government, because you know they can access this upon request from DJI, your flight logs. Well, this lets them know all these millions of drones where these users are flying in a certain area. So if the Chinese government, for instance, decides, okay, well, we want to do a coordinated attack against every single critical infrastructure facility all at one time at 60 days from now at a targeted time and a targeted date, DJI, we need you to push out a firmware update to all the DJI drones. You know, even the drones that aren't normally connected to the internet, you got them air gaps, you know, that they say we're doing a firmware update and it's absolutely necessary you do this firmware update, you know, for your drones to work properly. So of course it's gonna get everybody in to do it and they hide that into that update. It's not even that they're live back and forth streaming this. So you got the guys that, you know, monitor their data traffic, you know, how much data is getting sent packet wise. It's not a big, big amount of data that you'd have to embed in this. And as soon as they turn that drone on and they're flying that drone, whatever ones are active during that time, they fly and do that coordinated attack. You know, that's just one instance. You know, of course, that's a crazy far out there thing, but technically it's not, it's not, you know, something that couldn't be done. Chris, let me, great point. Uh, let me add something onto that. If you consider the world of cloud, uh, I was at Google for five years and you've got great companies like that. You've got Facebook. Consider that if you're using that off the shelf type, if you will, uh, technology to do your communicating, try and keep even Google from getting into other aspects. It's a full-time job mm -hmm. to, to get security from your desktop, much, much less your phone. Uh, can, can you imagine, you know, you had uh, great, you know, companies that have tried to, to crack this, but if, you know, what is it, if it's free, you know, you, you are the product yourself, but even what we have with our great U.S. companies, uh, GDPR is a factor in, in the EU, but when you go and change the game and say, I'm going to start off with my foundation being a Chinese company, you're, you're opening yourself up for an endless game of whack-a-mole on, on the security side. And one other thing on reciprocity at the nation state level, consider this. When's the last time you could look at Beijing with the same resolution on Google Maps as you could look at our nation? <laughs> so we are at a strategic imbalance to begin with. And when you consider that, and open source, I hope we talk about that. It's not a panacea, but just all the, the cards are stacked in the deck. So I get it that DJI will say, oh, we've got this government edition that's going to solve things. But you have to go back to first premises and go back to the situation you're getting yourself into. And I would say that the foundation is faulty and we need to do everything we can to get to USA options. But Chris, I, I would also add, I, you know, DJI is, you know, a, a favorite target to, to go after. But Think of just, you know, your GoPro cameras that are on here. I mean, here's all your metadata. Here's where you were flying, everything else. I live in the Northern Virginia area, and I can tell you that I am very cautious as to where I fly. I understand that, you know, what I'm flying uh, can easily get back to the wrong people, um, no matter if I have, you know, the, the Wi-Fi turned off on this or not. Because when I go to actually uh, take the card out of this and put it in my computer, what does it do? It syncs with a GoPro account. Yep. I, I can't just take this thing and make it work. GoPro says you have to have an account. Um, so there's your, you know, your firmware updates and other things. So there's plenty of back doors uh, that, you know, DJI can say, you know, we're the nicest people in the world. We won't spy on you anymore. Um, and there's still, you know, a hundred other ways to be able to get at you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. 
All right, let's move forward because this is a big topic. So as spying and hacking, this is this question's for Dr. Nichols and mom again. Uh, as spying and hacking of drone data can occur after the data is disseminated from the drone, what would you like to have organizations that use drone data for US defense or critical infrastructure projects have in place? Oh, this is easy. I thought you were gonna give me something tough. <laughs> the answer is risk assessment. The answer is risk management. The answer is determining what we have to defend before and what levels we have to defend at before we actually try to defend it. And let me give you a new tool and give the, the earth a new tool here. It's called the Ryan Nichols equation and it's for information. Uh, it's determining risk under unknown conditions. It's risk equals threats times vulnerabilities times impact divided by countermeasures. And it turns out that vulnerabilities and impact are both constants and drop out if you remember a little calculus. So that risk is just a function, a direct function of threats and an indirect function of countermeasures. This is a simple way to do things like stride. There's about 20 different risk models. Ours is the best, of course, but it's the simplest. And that was designed by Dr. Ryan, Dr. Julie Ryan and Dan Ryan and myself and kind of the end point over here. But I'm the hawker of it, if you will. And all my students have learned this very well because that's all I teach. At any rate, I want to show you how this might help us. Recently, there was a report by Rand called How to Analyze the Cyber Threat from Drones. And it talked about something that we talk about in the counter unmanned systems. I want you to picture four boxes, if you will. On one side, we have the DHS, which is in charge of all of the issues that we're talking about and doing the risk assessment and their, and their allies, if they have any. Uh, versus adversaries, that means China and everybody else, essentially, and everybody who wants to run a drone illegally. Um, we can think in terms of the unmanned aircraft being a, a cyber weapon or a cyber target, either way, so it depends on. So if we're looking at in terms of a cyber weapon from an adversary, here's some of the things that you might consider. A botnet style stealth network interaction enabled by mobile UAS and poorly protected Wi-Fi. Second, cascading infection of internet. By the way, this is Stuxnet, if you remember that one. Uh, cascading infection of internet things and home appliances, light bulbs, car changing, and also industrial equipment. If we're looking at it as a UAS cyber target, that means I'm gonna destroy the data rather than take the data. Uh, distorting or destroying collected probe data, take down, lock out, take over, so on. Um, another way to look at this against DHS would be spoofing, would be theft of identity would be uh, taking over the controls of a particular piece of equipment or a facility or facility management. None of this occurs without somebody saying, what are my, what are my targets? What is the, the best way to look at this? What's the worst case, the best case and the normal case? And you can determine that by, deter by essentially doing a risk assessment. And that risk assessment gives us an initial risk uh, analysis, and it gives us a, uh, the worst case by boosting it, if you will, and a best case by boosting it, boosting the, the factors of threats. We say the bad guy is gonna do something worse and we find out what that is and we calculate it. We do the same thing with the, the defense, in this case, which is DHS, and we do that. Those three numbers in the analysis, it's not, not as difficult as it might sound here, tell us several things. Let's say the average cyber type uh, risk is 20%. That's really high, actually, because nobody dies generally in a cyber attack. But uh, whereas if I'm putting a nuclear bomb or I'm exploding IDs, yes, they do. At any rate, let's say I have 20% as, as my risk assessment. I now have a number that is the best that I can add to or subtract from that says, well, 24% or 17%. I get a range, basically. DHS looks at that number along with a thousand other risk assessments and they have a budget There's X amount of dollars, millions and millions of dollars. And they go, what is the highest to the lowest? And they take the projects that have the highest risk assessment and that's what they put their money to. Unfortunately, drones and cyber are the lowest. It turns out that cyber attacks and cyber defenses and cyber money is the lowest of all the DHS because A, it is repeatable and easily uh, open sourced. B, it doesn't kill. It irritates the hell out of us, but it doesn't kill. It takes down computer systems, but what we're losing is information. And I maintain that information is much more important sometimes than bombs and bullets, because I can do a lot more damage by stealing 
700,000 visa cards, by the way, if you've ever had an identity theft, you know what I'm talking about. And that kind of problem from a personal standpoint or from a, from a facility standpoint, I can take down and stop the cooling water systems in a nuclear, in a nuclear plant. That is humongous. We actually did that out, uh, simulated that out in Pennsylvania here at Three Mile Island. And you, they, even, they even, by the way, had a movie with Jane Fonda, a wonderful Vietnam Memorial individual. At any rate, my point is risk assessment is the answer. Uh, risk assessment tells us what we need to protect, what the percentages or probabilities are, what the ranges are, and how much money we're probably going to have to put into the defense of that particular facility or a house. One more thing. We cannot at this moment legally shoot down a drone. We cannot above 400 for sure because it's an aircraft. Below it gets a little gray area because we now we got human beings involved and privacy issues. But technically still under the law, you cannot shoot down a drone. But there are lots of ways to do that. And I'm gonna cover that in, in one of the future places, I suppose, that you can actually disable the drone without shooting it down legally. And it disappears off of the radar for the, for the under the 400 uh, category. So I'd like to also add on there, you know, with, DG, or with DHS's assessment, you know, maybe they need to, get in a mindset of thinking, okay, drones, they're a moving physical kinetic object now. You know, it's not just purely a, a static computer sitting in an office or a device or, you know, a, a pump, you know, or, or a, a, an actuator. You know, these are physical, physically moving things that are moving in our environment then can, that can physically harm people and cause a lot of damage, whether it's a flying drone or a driverless vehicle going down the road. That's a 2,000 pound car, you know, so they need to get into that mindset and how do we push them into that to, to raise our, our cyber security from that aspect. The, the current view though, from a cyber security risk assessment standpoint is and use any other models, whether it be Stride or Pasta or the DOD version, any, any models, the Ryan Nichols is a simple one because it tends to focus it into low, medium, high or low, medium, that kind of thing or best, worst, and natural cases. That's why it's an easy model. But all the other models will tell you the same thing, that the cyber risks are not considered that way. They, they, consider, they consider them they are not harmful, per se, to human beings. They, they do harm. They do harm to a lot of things, but they're not considered, if I have a cafe that suddenly blows up and I kill not only the people in the cafe by the bomber, but I'm also preparing to take out the first responders. Right. That's a much more difficult problem or I'm, I'm having nuclear missiles aimed at you or the simulations we did between Iran and Israel where we're throwing nuclear bombs back and forth and killing hundreds of thousands of people um, or the, the simulations we did with using drones to distribute sarin gas over the, the various um, football stadiums at full pack. That really was a, an amazing thing and it still only was considered uh, even though we're killing people at that point, and by the way, they killed just as many by running away and being trampled and so on than they did from the actual gaseous dis distribution system. But my panic is what got them. The point is, DHS doesn't see it that way currently. They see almost everything, like the electrical grid is a big one, or like the treasury uh, finance is another one. All of the major 14 sectors are seen as, if you can take down our sector, that's a much higher risk even though it's going through cyber means at times, uh, then a drone, which is essentially stealing information or they see it as, as a nice big camera. You know, I got this fantastic camera from space that I can see all kinds of cool stuff, but that isn't killing anybody, I'm just irritating. That's, you're correct, that's wrong. We can do a lot more damage to people than just that. Mm -hmm. I agree. So I think, uh, Chris, I'll, I'll take off uh, where you started there. I think one of the challenges you have to look at is, uh, is not only can uh, an air and ground vehicle start to talk to each other uh, and become a weapon, it's pretty simple to do. Uh, right now you can go out on the internet and for about $1,000, you can figure out how to uh, automate your car. As a matter of fact, I think it's a Honda Accord that the young man actually aut fully automates for about $1,000. Now you simply talk to your drone. So you let your drone go off and do something. Uh, and now all of a sudden they're, they're looking up uh, instead of looking at the car that's packed with explosives that's coming through the gate. So the answer is, is all these autonomous systems have the ability to kill. It's how we're actually looking at them, whether it's uh, through policies or other things. Harry had mentioned NIST. 
NIST has uh, several different things that they're looking at out there, but they're, they're doing the same thing. They are not looking at this as an entire autonomous uh, infrastructure. So they're not looking at air, ground, sea, water, underwater, humanoid, cyber, and exoskeletons. They're not looking at all seven working together in order to obtain a goal. But guess what? Our enemies are. Um, oh, yeah. and, and it's not even just our enemies are, um, you know, local, local folks who are just interested in these things are looking at this. So, you know, as, as robots start to come into your house a little bit more, I mean, obviously I have, you know, I have a robot vacuum. Yes, I do. Uh, but uh, when you start to look at, at, you know, domestic robots that start to come into play, you know, how do you secure this different data? Now it's going through and, you know, one of the things that uh, they were concerned with, with the robot vacuums with Roomba, was that it was actually, uh, you know, basically making a, a map of your house in order to figure out how to vacuum your house better, right? Mm -hmm. So when you're looking at the, the data that comes off of the full autonomous systems, how do you protect it? You know, whether it's, you know, your, your normal cyber issues that come out whether it's your acquisition systems that are so bogged down and really don't understand the complexity of the problem in order to acquire things correctly and understand what policies need to go against it. Um, and then when you start to look at, you know, as Randy said, you look at risk management, um, you know, we've had a risk management framework out there, uh, uh, ICD-503, uh, for about 12 or 13 years. And there are several agencies who still haven't even started to require systems to have a, an RMF uh, for ATOs or anything else. So how are we going to get to the point where, you know, we're bringing this data down off of these sensors because that's a drone is just a truck for sensors. So you're bringing this data down. So if you've got a law enforcement agency who has a warrant to use one of these things and they have the ability to use thermal imagers through walls, they have the ability to do GPS tracking and uh, tag track and locate on cars and things like that, that information is coming back into just a law enforcement uh, um, entity. Well, how much money do they have for cyber? How comfortable are you that, that all of that data, all of that data is there? And by the way, how many times have they no-knock warranted the wrong house? Well, how easy it is to thermal maybe your house when the house next to you, because you live in a condo, the house next to you is the one that's on the warrant. And if they find you have grow lights because they see the thermal, do they go after you? Are you really, you know, growing drugs? Or maybe you just like flowers. Well, guess what? All that information is up to grab. Oh yeah, I, I can't tell you how many times uh, as an operator, especially in our early days in the army, we'd be overhead of a compound and we'd have ground forces that are gonna go in and uh, grab up a high value individual or target. And so we, we're surveilling the, the compound or the house ahead of time or it's in a neighborhood and the guys roll up and you get them all, you see them all getting all lined up and I'm, we were like, we had to call them like, guys, you're about to kick in the wrong door. It's the one next to it. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, that happens, but, but that's just, that's the way it is a lot of times. Well, and, the, and the challenge too is, is that, you know, how easy is that data uh, to get a hold of, whether it's a man in the middle attack or whether it's, you know, already disseminated and mm -hmm. it's sitting down at, you know, somebody's ground station and I may get a hold of that information. Well, that information is valuable to me, especially as a terrorist, because you can do all kinds of wonderful stuff with it. Well, it's also valuable to me as you know, just a normal bad guy, just somebody who is, is doing nefarious things, because that information tells me a lot about how to hide from you, how to start to change my tactics, and what I'm doing and where I'm going. And then we, we have to start looking at the idea of, you know, uh, what is the privacy? Is there any privacy? I mean, satellites have been over our head for decades. So is there really privacy? Right. Uh, yeah, I mean, you, you have the fidelity with satellites. It, it's there. You know, they can utilize that. Drones are obviously, uh, they bring that cost point to acquire the data much lower. Um, and you have a, a privacy concern, even with uh, public agencies using drones. You know, they're collecting this data. Even if you're out and about in public, walking around, your face gets captured on the camera. What's their storage policy of the data? You know, and what prevents somebody from gathering that data, running it through their own facial recognition program and saying, okay, so-and-so was here at this time because uh, they pulled it from that video very easily. You know, they didn't have to work hard to know where you were in that time and place. Well, and, and with COVID uh, and with the very interesting things that are going on right now, uh, there are states, uh, I won't call too many of them out, just say that there are states that are using uh, license plate readers. 
Um, yeah. And you know, those things are nicely uh, put onto UAVs and other things to be able to go out. Uh, now, all of a sudden, uh, if I'm coming in from another state because my license plate was red, um, I get a knock on the door. Um, was that a true legitimate use of this technology? I don't know. Okay, uh, moving forward, let's see. Um, Joel, I think uh, you, you'll have a good answer for this one. Organizations like AUVSI, uh, the FAA, and the Department of Transportation, uh, what can organizations like that do uh, to help advance the DOD's uh, trusted marketplace for drones? Uh, thank you, Bart. Um, yeah, I, I've i been working on this a lot because, you know, because the Honeycomb security system, which I'm glad gave me the opportunity to speak, is I've been working on the cyber supply chain and IC supply chain security for drones. And I think what has to happen along with this, we have to, the universities and AUVSI have to cordon off a, a capability to be secure. Because if we're educating the world and that we see our vision of educating the world and then racing up to see how fast we can look at all the risks with capabilities, we cannot move as fast as some countries who are autocratic. They can put like 250,000 hackers. How many hackers in this country do we have? 8,000? So at the end of the day, we have got to come up with what are the catalysts that AUVSI and FAA, and how do they better work together with a group like the USA Drone Port and start bringing in a whole new environment, and we call this the Silicon Prairie, uh, what I work with now across states, because we believe the Silicon Valley's advertising model and brokering people's data around the world for free has created this kind of culture where we can share everything with everybody, even if it's drone data, and, and make money off of it. Well, the Silicon Prairie is going to have a different business model. We're not going to make money off your privacy data, off your drone data. The only people who should get your drone data are the people who you use it for that purpose, just like a chip, a fit for purpose. We don't need chips telling the world what we're doing, but yet we have OSs on a chip. The Chinese come out, your router now may have a Chinese chip with an OS on top of it. So we have got to come up with a whole new paradigm of supply chain security. And because it's like we could patch ourselves to death and there's a lot of money in patching the, the model fail often, fail fast. Well, I'm sorry, you don't want to fly drones that fail often and fail fast or jets. But yet we have people running our military who think Harvard is to fail often, fail fast, and that's a great model. We need to build it secure from the ground up, design in security. From an academic perspective, where are the courses for counter drone warfare? Where are the courses that teach people the dual use nature of these drones? That yes, that could be great drones, but flip it. And all of a sudden, let's say I am a nefarious. I want to take control of that drone and I want to do something bad with it. What does it mean to go from defense to offense? A lot of times we debate that between the DOD and the Intel community or, but if you're thinking about it, if you're trying to prevent a drone or land, air, sea, whatever, from doing damage to a grid or your nuclear power plant or whatever, have, where are the, why don't we engage the students? We have this thing called the STEM robotics program around the world. We're, we should be engaging ideas and testing out those ideas for live exercises, which the USA drone port can be a foundation for to really start transitioning this paradigm. And again, you gotta be secure. Everything that a university does, the thousand talents program, we can't have nationalists from foreign countries working in the bowels of AI, machine learning, and drone, kind of drone warfare, which unfortunately, University of Hawaii a couple of years ago, Chinese nationalist, Ying Fang Dong was right there in counter drone warfare. I couldn't believe it. So at the end, I think we need to, you know, just start building a whole new curriculum, a whole new test and evaluation regime, and a whole new uh, dual use counter methodology that is embraced not just by our military intelligence community, but is embraced by civilian agencies who need to collaborate better with those who have in-depth experience in this industry. Can I make an addendum on that? Because he hit on some really good stuff. Real short, 
there is at least one university doing exactly what you said, Joel, and that's Kansas State University, and it's out of the Salina uh, Polytechnic Group. They not only have a testing port, we have an airport next to us that we have permission to use, and we have classes in certificate, not master's level, but it's very practical. It's counter unmanned aircraft systems. It's also risk assessment and open source intelligence and counterintelligence, counter espionage, cyber wise, sorry. All of those are incorporated into the 15 hour courses that we have proposed to places like uh, Fort Leavenworth uh, mm -hmm. to their command uh, and general staff uh, college. And we'll know whether we have that fairly soon. My point is there are some, There's, there are others by the way, not just KSU, but they are few and far between, I agree. Most of these are taught in what I would call a military setting uh, or in a uh, uh, agency setting. And they're very limited to whatever that agency says. I agree, we need to have a much more broader view and uh, almost a global view in, in terms of what we're talking about here. Right. And counter unmanned uh, systems, are de operations and technologies are definitely a, a requirement for training resources to protect the United States. Okay. And that has been my goal for nearly 40 years. Right. So, uh, yes, so, there's at least so, one. <laughs> so let me get back to you. And, and I think that everyone who listens to this broadcast should go talk to their senators. We need to get people educated of what the threats are and how rapidly they're growing, not just in the cyber area, but in the drone area and what that means. We need to get senators around the country behind this. We need to, we need to build momentum and a tipping point where they, each state, you know, you have a model like a USA drone port, but that, or what you have at Kansas State, but we need to replicate this. We need to get a bunch of people organized to really realize the value of this because when you have 20 states getting free drones to surveil the American people from a foreign country, there's something, we're not educating people well about the, the downside or the dual use aspects of what they're doing. Yep. Jump in right here. And uh, Joel, I agree with you. I think some other things that could be done uh, in addition, and one basic thing is let's start doing demonstrations like you can do at Droneport USA. Uh, another organization that wasn't mentioned is a Naval Postgraduate School. Uh, they have a facility, uh, SLAMR, S-L-A-M-R, I think is the acronym, but just look up Naval Postgraduate School and drones. And they have uh, multi-domain drones, not just the, the flying kind, they have rolling, uh, those that'll work for maritime. Uh, the University of Maryland, great program as an example. Uh, other places, but we have to, for the uh, not just the federal, but also the state governments, have them actually lean in, understand what's going on with these demonstration pilots. But the main thing is to make it easy for people to see what's going on. So one other aspect is to consider uh, the Navy, for example, has live virtual constructive. The Army has synthetic training environments. But what about a digital twin approach as well? Not everybody can come to Droneport USA uh, but not everybody can go over to where these facilities uh, exist, but imagine having a, a secured and, a, and a, a safe way to show we are going to collaboratively design these cyber physical systems. And let's not forget they are socio cyber physical systems when you consider the trust element, uh, the concerns about privacy. So there are commercial off the shelf drone simulators uh, that are out there. Drone Racing League has one. I know Microsoft's part of another. Wouldn't it be amazing if you could not only have uh, the equipment at these facilities, but also have the computer science folks and even the poli sci cross disciplinary uh, approaches where everybody could get a chance to see, participate in their own way. You could take it even down to STEM. Dean Kamen, Joel, mm -hmm. uh, you and yep. I have talked about this. There's yes. first robotics. I personally want to see an equivalent type of drone type effort that captures everyone's imaginations. One, well, you hear, heard it here first, maybe. Esports are big, but there's no cardiovascular. I know Pokemon will say, yeah, they got cardiovascular, but that's kind of like golf. What if you had something like drone laser tech? In all seriousness, half of a basketball court, I can take a, a drone from a great American company, like on a Skydio, the Teal drone, wh whatever it is, or open source, build your drone, and then you have the, the tag elements, and kids could play. They understand about the STEM aspects, the spectrum, you know, you could have someone who's trying to run around, tag one drone, another person's the guy or gal in the chair. But the, my main point is we could also fly indoor drones as well. 
we need to do more of it. But as far as real missions go, the law enforcement, public safety, fire departments, they don't have all of the bandwidth or the resources individually to get after all of these elements. So what has to happen is the private sector has to be informed, has to learn about all of these things. Yes, you've got great senators, leaders like Senator Scott, who put out the Drone Security Act. That's legislation. There's folks on the House side. So there's legislation starting with saying, government folks, don't buy these Chinese drones. That's great. But I think we also need some more certainty on purchase authority, on money to give the certainty for these USA companies to know we can go after this and it's not a moving target. And that's how you build the critical mass. We have to treat this. This is important enough to do that. And so I would say that's one way that we can get uh, these folks in, involved. And of course, the FAA, Department of Transportation, AUVSI does a, a great service. Brian Wynn, great American, but I know it's open. We're an open uh, society. Right. So you better believe DJI is right there in AUVSI. That's great. We can take their money, but let's, you know, let's leave it at a certain point and understand the influence that exists even in that institution. FAA, yes, they're going through difficult things with remote ID, uh, it, you know, uh, UAS traffic management, all these things are real, but let's not leave it so no one else knows about it. We have to do the hard work of informing everybody, the American public, about how this is important. And we saw it recently with COVID. Hans made a reference to what's going on with COVID right now. Well, how about those drones that were gifted? Talk about Trojan horse. DJI gave law enforcement drones. And they, you know, there's the, the idea of using them for social distancing monitoring. You had uh, Representative Gates from from uh, from Florida also, like Senator Scott, lost his mind. The National Review covered this. This was a national news story a couple days back. And we need to get ahead of the, the ball, you know, the curve, let people experience these things in ways that they can understand in their individual states and communities. But the big thing is when you say follow the money, how about we provide the money and find a way collectively as free Americans that we can take our resources and say, we are going to choose to go with the USA drone manufacturer for something that's real and that we can start getting started on right now. So Bart, I just want to piggyback on Harry because I think a lot of people hear about all this and they think a lot of it is going to take a lot of money. And back in 2007, Dr. Eric Frost of San Diego State did a thing called Golden Phoenix. And Golden Phoenix just created the environment where everybody could play, law enforcement, defense, first responders, everybody could play and they could use their training budgets and all that the San Diego State had to pay for was coffee and donuts and lunch. And they just gave them the environment to play and that really what that did is advance that needed interoperability between the data that law enforcement and first responders and other people, National Guard need to share anyway. But yet sometimes our culture in this country is very stovepipe because that's how a lot of big boys make a lot of money. We need to find a way with the drone port and other things to bring these exercises and environments where it's affordable. Joel, I love that. Let me jump in on it. I mean, agreed. Uh, you have great facilities like Muscatatuck. Uh, you've got, there the, are the ranges everywhere. But the question is, how does the private sector get involved? Uh, and as an example, what if Amazon or Google or UPS or FedEx or companies, uh, AT&T, they're in it for a Naval Postgraduate School, million dollar 5G node donated so that those drones can go into the next, you know, into what's next. But imagine if you had contests, what if you had a challenge space and look at what DARPA, DARPA has a subterranean challenge. They have fast, lightweight autonomy. Uh, you've, you've got great Americans working on these issues, but collectively and collectively there's money. Lockheed, one million, one, no, $2 million prize money for an AI version of a drone that could compete with a human drone racer. I think they gave a million dollars to a European team. Okay. Mm -hmm. So more of that, please. <laughs> so that's how you get, you know, get all generations involved. But again, let's pretend we're from Missouri. Show me. Show me now. Yes, let's plan for the future. But we have to get these wins and these pragmatic sink my teeth into it projects that move the ball forward. And we have to coordinate. It's hard, but we have to make sure everybody's getting involved as much as possible. Right. Agree. <laughs>
Also, please visit our website at the posted link if you're interested in registering as a known entity or individual with your products or services, and if you'd like to work with us on moving the drone industry forward and be part of our database of partners.